it is my honor to introduce to you our very first guest speaker for this conference. He is a catalyst of innovation. He is a champion of innovation, and he came all the way from Sweden to be with us today. As Sweden's finance minister and prime minister from 1996 to 2000, uh, from the 1990s all the way to 2006, he was a prime minister of his country from 1996 to 2006. He helped end a severe financial crisis and restore the country back to health. He is here with us today to share and inspire all of us with what it takes to become a sustainable society. We shall all learn from him examples and ideas of innovating at every stage, from top to bottom, from bottom up. And that is why his country, Sweden, is one of the leading countries on innovation. Economic development, environment, technology, Integrating and engaging various groups of society plus managing crisis are some of the key ingredients in building a stable and successful nation like his. So ladies and gentlemen, delegates, let us all please welcome to Malaysia and Asia and the World Innovation Forum 2013 Kuala Lumpur, Sweden's former Prime Minister, Goran Persson. Let me try to turn on this mic. Good morning. Good morning, Prime Minister. Welcome Thank you. to Malaysia Thank you. and to Asia. Maybe please take our seats here yeah. because before your presentation, you know, I want to find out a few things about the Prime Minister of Sweden. And one thing I would like to ask you, you've come back to Malaysia a few times during your term as a Prime Minister and as a citizen, why, why, do you, why do you come back to Malaysia? Why did you accept this offer to be a speaker at the World Innovation Forum Kuala Lumpur 2013? Malaysia is um, a very warm and friendly country with a very... <laughs> yes, I like the people, I like the ambitions, and I must say I admire what you have achieved so far. And then also, and that is important, Malaysia is not one of the biggest countries in Asia. It is for a European, a country of our, our size, understandable, and also a partner for the future. I have met with your leading politicians for many years. I have seen what your companies have been able to do. I know what will happen in this country in the future. And I want to see Sweden and Malaysia as partners. Sweden and Malaysia partners and uh, Prime Minister, this is indeed a monumental task to be able to organize this world-class conference of the World Innovation Forum KL 2013, how significant is it that it's being mounted and being staged in Malaysia and in Asia? Extremely important. And this is the way of uh, communicating today. This is the way of building networks. You meet with others. You get to know others. You have information. You exchange views. You are building a relation that you can use as a foundation for the future. Those who take the initiative to host events of this kind, they will also be the winners in the future because we will all refer to our discussions in Kuala Lumpur 2013. And you did it possible. Thank you for that. And the Prime Minister, in today's uh, ever competitive environment, how must uh, governments, uh, corporations, uh, individuals uh, view the process of innovation. How important is it today? 
It is a completely natural part of daily work. It is an attitude. It is a way of looking upon solving problems. And if you don't mobilize every one of your citizens, if you don't mobilize your institutions to constantly question what you have done before and constantly asking them for new ideas, you will get stuck in the old solutions. Therefore, this is the way of not only meeting the future, it is also a way of creating the future to be innovative. And Prime Minister, you mentioned about innovation, creating the future, having a new attitude, adapting uh, to new innovations. But I noticed that you will be giving your presentation in a few minutes' time, but you will not be having a PowerPoint presentation. You do not have an iPad. You do not have a Samsung Galaxy. You do not have a smartphone. But you still have with you a notebook for all the Prime Minister's notes. It is quite surprising. Why haven't you adapted, Prime Minister, to social media? You've told me during our earlier conversations that you are not on Twitter, you are not on Facebook, but now this whole world of innovation has embraced, has embraced social media. What do you think are still the problems why you haven't crossed over to the social media world? And you still keep your notes right here in your notebook. Yeah. <laughs> you, you reminded me about putting my phone on silent. OK. Yes. <laughs> there you go. That, yes. Uh, yes, it is perhaps a little bit strange, because um, the penetration of this modern technology in Sweden is perhaps in the top of the world. And we have done a lot to encourage ordinary people to early adopt, early change to the new. I am also, of course, using it, of course. But when I prepare my speeches, I do it as I always have done it, with a pen and a paper. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it myself. That is important. I have met too many politicians. I have met too many politicians who are traveling around giving lectures and delivering speeches that somebody else have written. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> I'm doing it myself and preparing it myself. It's a part also of a constant learning process. So therefore, pen and paper is not a bad uh, friend when you're traveling around the world. But I also, of course, carrying my iPad not least to be able to solve the crosswords <laughs> I have on it. So, so it's a new word, yes, but still, a pen and a paper is a very, very good tool if you want to be active intellectually. And why don't you still put your speeches or your notes in your iPad after your presentation? What are you saying then, uh, Prime Minister, about social media and the internet? Yeah. I, there, I, are dis th there are disadvantages. Yes, of course. I could, of course, be much more efficient, of course. But I'm also a little bit worried about um, the integrity and uh, not least um, sharing too much of my privacy on the internet with everybody else. I have my life. I want to live my life. And uh, no, I'm a, little bit, I'm a little bit careful about that dimension, the integrity dimension. But I could be more efficient spreading my information, of course. And I have those who are helping me doing that. But I'm writing my speeches myself. Writing your speeches so we will not really be able to convince you to put all of these notes on your iPad or on your iPhone. And indeed, let's give the Prime Minister a big round of applause for Thank flying you. all the way here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to be with us to present his views about innovation and how Sweden has been successful in having a very sustainable society. And now we would like to welcome... Prime Minister Gordon Persson of Sweden with his 
presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me to your beautiful country and this important conference. I must say that um, I have followed Malaysia for quite many years, met with your prime ministers and exchanged views with them and other representatives for your society. It is an impressive development that you have been able to carry out the last 20 years when I have followed the development in this part of the world. Congratulations. The best thing is that you have just started. You have uh, excellent opportunities for the future. Wonderful days are ahead of you if you manage to compete, if you manage to um, develop your society and your companies. You have laid the foundation. Now it's up to you to prove that you also will be able to take the next step. It's not only about the future we desire. It's also about a future you deserve. So don't wait. Start innovating and start working. Because if you come too late, you will be punished by history. Thank you once more for inviting me. I want to share with you a broad perspective on innovation. I want to do it with the backdrop of my own experiences, and not least what I can see around the world regarding development, not least in the economic field. Then I will also say something about what I think will be the most important research and development areas for the future, and uh, what will happen if we fail to solve the problems we have ahead of us. I start with an international reflection regarding economy. Because in the end, if the economy goes in the wrong direction, it will be a tremendous problem for not least the innovative sector. When I had the task being a Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister in Sweden, I always constantly studied the trade figures. Were we able to compete or not? Because I knew if we were out-competed, the unemployment would start to grow, and then we would have a deterioration in the public finances. And that is the worst thing that can happen to a country that has ambitions to go for reform and investment in the new growing areas, for instance, with help of innovation. Without sound public finances, you are, you are lost. Without trade and competitiveness, you will not end up in a situation with sound public finances. If you look around the world today, you can see many countries struggling hard with their finances. And um, that's worrying, because Malaysia's future, you can, of course, do a lot on your own. But if the rest of the world goes in the wrong direction, if the economy doesn't grow fast enough, you will have a problem as well as the others, even if you are doing everything in the right way. You are dependent. You are interdependent. And that is not a pendulum that has swung to its point and now will swing back again. It's an ongoing process. 
the integration of the economies is something that gives a small country huge opportunities but also brings some risks if you start misbehaving. So the integration of the economies in a world where you can see that big economies have economic problems will sooner or later bring those problems also to your own country. Then you have to be prepared, you have to take action, you have to counteract as much as possible. Of course I'm worried about the US if you look upon the public financial situation. But on the other hand, if you look upon the real economy in the US, it is strong. And it is, it is a young nation. Don't forget that. It is a growing nation. It is a nation with a lot of kids and youngsters. It's a nation with excellent scientific institutions, excellent universities, and the best systems for innovations in the world. They will survive, no doubt. They will solve their political problems with uh, the budget, no doubt. If they fail to do it, no, I don't want to discuss that because I don't think it's realistic, but if they fail to do it, it is a disaster for the rest of the world. We are integrated. Their failure will be our, our reality as well. I think they solve it. Then you have the next giant, China. Just now, up for a very, very difficult discussion about the economic future. How to reform a central planned economy driven by investments in not least infrastructure and heavy industry. How to reform such an economy to an economy that is based on domestic demand and consumption among ordinary people. If they manage to do so, we have good prospects for the future. If they fail to do it, we have a growing problem with the Chinese relation. The Chinese leadership have a much more difficult task than the American leadership when they have to solve their problems. I think the Americans just yes, will solve it. I realize that the Chinese have to solve the next step, have to take the next step in their economic development. Same goes for the old countries in Europe. We have a very dangerous development in Europe. Europe is still a big economic partner, very big, and will continue to be big, consisting of a lot of different countries cooperating inside the European Union, where I had once the task having the presidency of the European Council. I believe in the European project, but we have, we have very big problems to solve, not in all countries, but in some huge economies in the southern part of Europe. And just now we have a very worrying sum development regarding the deflationary development. It can't, I don't think it will happen, but there is a risk. So Europe, US, China. I'm leaving Malaysia to go to India. There you also have something to solve, to express myself a little bit careful. And you see that type of problem around the world just now. On the other hand, there are also promising countries, developing countries. So the world economy might slow down, but I think it will continue to grow. And as long as the world economy grows, you will have an opportunity as a small open economy to export your goods and services if you are competitive enough. But it is a very dangerous situation it is a very difficult time we have ahead of us. I will not hide that for you. So much can go in the wrong direction, but also so much can be solved if we cooperate and do it together. But this is a backdrop that is important to have. And for me, who has been Minister of Finance and Prime Minister, there is nothing as devastating for a country as mismanaged public finances and um, as a growing unemployment 
and there's a growing deficit in public finances. You can have plans regarding education, universities, regarding innovation structures, all that. You can have bold plans if you don't have the resources needed to go for those plans, you are lost. So therefore, without sound public finances, you are in a very troublesome situation. And you can see that as well. If you compare countries who are successful with innovation around the world, you can see that those who also have order in their own house regarding economic development, they are also in top of innovation. Or is it they who are in top of innovation also have order in their economic development. We can discuss that, but there is no doubt a connection. For me, it is not difficult to say it. It is easy to say that you have to restore public finances. It is easy to realize what you have to do. The difficult thing is to do it. That goes for much of economic and political leadership. It's not so difficult to realize what to do. The difficult thing is to do it and stick to it. Challenge the opinion and the electorate. Putting your job at stake. Being prepared to leave if they don't want to go in the right direction. I have such experience. And uh, I had once an option to do what I thought was the right thing to do and probably not be re-elected, or abstain and for sure not be re-elected. And of course then the choice was quite easy. For me, innovation and development is about not climbing to the top. You can see that, that countries have been able to climb higher and higher, being able to compete and win. When you have reached the top, then the real difficult thing starts, and that is to stay there, to maintain your position. That is as difficult as reaching the top. Because when you have been successful, creating methods, institutions, improving quality, then you often have a lay-back attitude where you say, now we are among the best in the world. Um, you don't say, let's relax, but that is more or less the content. And if you start relaxing when you have reached the top, you will soon fall down again. It's a question of constant reform, permanent reform. It's a question of constantly evaluating what you are achieving. It's a question of comparing yourself with the best institutions in the world. It's a question of building different institutions that have as a task to constantly evaluate what you are doing. Because innovation, not seldom, start with a good education system. And there you have a possibility to compare yourself with others. And um, if you fail with the education system, you can be sure about one thing. You will fail also with uh, not only primary, but also the secondary and the tertiary education system. And then you are in a very troublesome situation. Economic development in the world not seldom goes hand in hand with a falling birth rate. Most economic successful countries have a falling birth rate. Fewer and fewer children. Therefore, it is so important that every child has a good education, that the school system don't miss anyone. It is extremely important that you realize that the new society that is emerging is built on brain power. It's built on intellectual capacity. Therefore, we need to have a gender perspective on all education, to bring also the girls, as the boys, to their utmost performance. 
to see to that they take stock of them all. We can see in Sweden now, for instance, that those who fulfill their academic exam, a majority of them, a vast majority, are the female part of the population. The girls, the young women, and then you have to ask yourself if the young women's, uh, women's are those who fulfill their education, how can we maintain them in the workforce? How can we give them conditions so it is possible both bringing up children and staying in the professional life because they have performed best in the education system? Countries who are missing this will end up in a situation with a lack of qualified workforce, with a lack of qualified scientists. It's extremely important to realize the connection between economic growth and birth rate and gender equality and competitiveness. And without competitiveness, you are a loser in an integrated international economy. So the success with the economic development brings a new society. The new society must constantly adapt change to be able to see to that everyone can deliver its utmost of capacity. To stay at the top is to go for a constant reform program, is to go for a program that everyone in the society has the chance and the right to participate. If you don't do that, you will be a loser because there is a lack in the future for workforce. That's my, my firm opinion. I have told you, good economic development brings lower birth rate, brings a need to reform the education system, brings the need for a modern society where you give the opportunity to combine the race of children and a professional activity for both a young man and a woman. It's a very, very important part of our success story. Then you have the universities. Of course, they must be open for everyone. They must be free of different type of fees. You must also have some type of economic support for young people who want to go for university. And you need to have excellence in both education and um, in research and development. You need to compare. You need to evaluate. We constantly do so. And we constantly end up being a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, uncertain about are we behaving well or not. Uh, constant debate about that. Then we can see, when you take a look at our industry, our industrial sector, when they came, will come into that environment with their university background, they perform excellent. But it is also a question of a lifelong development of the capacity, of uh, the competence. It is also giving the right for people to come back to study, make more of university experiences, uh, combine their, their professional career with um, a recurrent education activity. That is important to develop. We are not ready with that yet, but it is underway. We are trying to solve it. It's very important. We will lo live long lives. We will work long lives. We will continue to work until we are 65, 70. I'm convinced about that. Therefore, you need to constantly adjust your education. You need to add new dimensions to it. You need to give the right to do that. And you need to do it in cooperation with your own company. So the universities, the primary school system, 
are extremely important. And we have also the good ideas, the innovations, not seldom carried out in uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. How to support them, how to build institutions that uh, give the support for a um, very excellent innovation, financing, giving them the possibility to test it. We have built around all universities institutions of that kind. We are offering finances for those who have a good idea. And uh, we are constantly discussing how to improve that. It's always, it's always not enough. It's always too late. Uh, but it is a process going on where we meet the innovators, meet their companies, their ideas, try to support and not try, try not to, to destroy it the process because it is important. For me it's also a question of, um, of realizing that politicians should not go into details. I have seen many colleagues around the world who are extremely focused on one or another task and want the education system or the research and development system to focus on that. Not seldom that ends up in mistakes. Sometimes they are lucky, have focused on the right thing. But it is a dangerous development when politicians start to decide about what is the important thing to do. To give the best conditions for the research and development society, for the universities, to choose to take responsibility and then to evaluate has been our way to do it. Frameworks, policy making is something we are focusing on. Financing, evaluation is other things we are focusing on. Not deciding exactly what to do. Then of course we have focus areas. Areas that is in our own interest that we want to develop. For instance, in Sweden, we have had for many years, of course, a very, very huge activity in connection with forestry. If you visit Sweden, you will see that Sweden is literally a forest. 75% of our land is forest. And we have the biggest uh, paper exporting industry in the world together with Germany. It is a forestry-based economy. Of course, that gives us the signal that that sector needs to have resources, institutions that can go for innovation and research. Exactly what they shall do is up to them to decide. But of course, it is a focus area where we have resources enough for them to develop. According to our opinion, if you ask the institutions and the researchers, they say we don't have enough resources. Even if we spend most in the world, together with uh, two, three other countries, as a part of our GDP on uh, research and development innovation, uh, it is nevertheless not enough. But uh, when we try to prioritize, we say these are focus areas and forestry is such an area. Another is mining, of course. Mining and steel also something that is a fortune for our country, can sometimes be looked upon an old-fashioned industry. Yes, perhaps, but if you look carefully into it, you will see excellent technologies, excellent competitive industries, the best possible equipment for mining around the world, because we have had that as a basis for our economy in a close cooperation between the state and the universities and the companies, a close cooperation. And that type of cooperation has also been one of the explanations behind why we have been able to build the multinational Swedish companies. It has been a very close cooperation between the companies and universities 
and not least technical universities, a very close cooperation. And we have been able to build companies in the machinery sector, pharmaceuticals, paper and pulp, mining, telecom, automotive, the transport sector, with brands that are worldwide, multinational and successful, in a close cooperation. Then you have one more test. It's not only the public sector who is contributing with financing. It is also the private sector who has choose to enter into such a cooperation. And there you have directly a quality test. Is this relevant for the future market or not? It might be relevant for the academic society, but is it relevant for the future market? And there you have a very fruitful, ongoing, constantly ongoing discussion. A third area of that kind, besides forestry and mining, is our defense industry. We once chose to stay outside military alliances, to be a neutral country. Therefore, we also had to produce our own military equipment. We didn't want to end up as being dependent on the Soviet Union or the NATO. We said if we are outside military alliances, we also need to have our own military equipment. So therefore, we built an industry in that sector. Today, selling their equipment around the world, a successful industry, without any political uh, conditions except human rights, democracies, and all that that is in line with our political tradition at home that should also be practiced abroad. So we are one of the few countries who can sell an air fighter, who can sell a submarine, who can sell a radar system, who can sell howitzers, and so on. It's very strange, very odd, I must say. And as a prime minister for a small country like this, you are engaged from time to time in businesses of that kind, realizing then that the only one who compete with you are those who are members of the permanent, the permanent members of the Security Council, and then a small economy in the north part of Europe, because we decided to stay outside military alliances. That has brought to Sweden a tremendous technological development in research and development. Uh, around that you will find a cloud of inventions, ideas, networks that brings a lot to our telecom industry, to the, our heavy trucks industry, and so on. It is a very fruitful cooperation. But it was, from the beginning, based on a political decision standing outside military alliances. That was our own decision, and that brought this development. It is quite strange, but that is the case. So we are extremely strong, combining pharmaceuticals, combining life sciences, combining the heavy industries, automotives, and so on. We are extremely strong in these sectors despite we are a small country. And that is because we had the opinion that we should cooperate between the companies and the universities and have done so for more, almost 50, 60, 70 years successfully. We will continue to do so. The competition is fierce. And if I listen around the world today, the only advice to solve the economic problem you can hear is more of free trade, more of free trade agreements. I, I applaud that, because that is one of the reasons why we have been successful. But if the world goes in that direction, and I have no reason to think that it will not, then you will have a world that will be more and more difficult to compete in, will demand more and more of you who want to sell your products. The economic crisis we are just now experiencing will bring more of free trade, that is my guess, and free trade 
will give more of demand on competitiveness on your, your industrial and your service sector. If you are able to meet that, then you are among the winners. If you have a research and development sector that is good enough, then you will be among those who can meet these new conditions. This is the broad picture. Then ask me about what will happen in the future. And I'm prepared to give you an answer, but that is my guess, I must say. I have met so many politicians around the world who have tried to answer questions about the future, and they have had the wrong ideas. They have failed to answer, but they have been convinced when they have presented their answers. So I must say, when you are talking about the future, you can discuss principles, you can discuss institutions, you can discuss development regarding economy. But when you're talking about the scientific development in the future, then uh, it is extremely difficult to guess. If I had told you 10 years ago that one of the growing, strongest growing sectors in the Swedish economy uh, will be games for computers, no one should have thought that that was a good idea. But it is. Young boys and girls, they haven't even fulfilled their academic education. And they are constructing wonderful products for the rest of the world. And it is growing extremely fast. I didn't know that 10 years ago. And I don't know either about what will happen the coming 10 years. But there is one thing I'm quite sure about, and that is, <coughs> in the end, market economy is some type of a response to a need that is felt among the society. A need that can be solved with new products or services. That is the ideal picture. What I see in front of me is a development where we need to um, meet the climate change, need to do something. It's not about me. I'm old enough to be able to go on to another world until it is too late on this world. But my children and their children, what is their future? Will we accept that the extreme weather we have seen recently will be a natural part of their daily life? Is that something we can accept? <coughs> or um, can we do something? Yes, I think we can. I think we have to. And when I say this, and I have done that for the last 20 years almost, in the beginning I had a very strong conflict with the traditional industry. <clears throat> they thought that um, environmental demands was a break on economic development. They looked upon it as a threat. I constantly said, it's not a threat. It's a driving force because it's about new technologies. If you shall solve the problem with climate change, do you think it's possible to use the old technologies? Or is it time to introduce new? Of course it is. I'm not afraid of the new technology. I'm afraid of the old technology. I'm afraid of climate change. But saying climate change, that means that we need to address a lot of different issues. And you have mentioned some in this um, seminar program. The urbanizations, for instance. The um, renewable energy sector. The distribution of energy. The transport sector. Everywhere where you see that you can get more out of less, you have a contribution to solve the climate problem. The climate problem 
the environmental demands are extremely strong driving forces for new technologies. New technologies, that means research and development, that means investment, and that means new jobs, it means economic growth. Without new technologies, we will not be able to solve the problem with climate change. It's a moral dimension to this. As I said, I will pass on to another word in a short period, but my children will be here, and their children. What do we leave to them? What do they inherit? There is a moral, as we use, among Swedish farmers, and that is to say that we inherited our farm in a condition, but we will leave it in a better condition to the next generation. I represent the generation that might end up in a situation where we deliver Mother Earth in a worse condition compared to what we inherited from our parents. It's a tremendous moral challenge in that perspective. And that can only be solved, that can only be attacked with new technologies, research and development. So if you ask me about the future, it's about energy, it's about infrastructure, it's about using material in a more efficient way. It's about taking stock of the urbanization to solve the climate problem. If we don't do it, it will end up in the disastrous development, not for me, but for my children. That is a tremendous sector. Those who are the winners in that sector will also be those who have the products for the next generation in the world economy. A second task, graying societies. We are becoming older and older. We need life sciences that focus on the possibilities with a long life, that focus on what will happen to the society with a graying society that focus on the economic dimension of this. Remember, it is not the 66-year-old that is the driving force for economic growth. It is the six-year-old. And many and many of the most developed countries will end up in a situation where the population contains of a lot of 66-year-old people and quite few six-year-old. What will this bring? How can we handle this? And then, of course, also discussing information technology and biotechnology, because there you have a part of the future solutions. What have I told you? Five lessons, I think. First, it starts with a good education system. It starts in the primary school system. If you fail there, then you will have a problem in the next phase. Second, never think that politicians are able to point out exactly what will be the future regarding technology. No, it must be up to a process driven mainly by the industry and the universities. Thirdly, never forget that um, you must remain attractive when you have reached the top. Never forget that you need to take stock of the whole population. Fourth, never mismanage your public finances because if you do so, then you are sooner or later on the slippery slope. And fifth, I think the tremendous challenge with climate change is the driving force we need for the next step in economic development in the world. That is what I think and reflect upon with the backdrop of my long period as a prime minister and a European politician. And I'm extremely grateful that I had had the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. And as I said when I started, it's not only about the future we desire, it will be a future we deserve. So why wait? 
start working immediately and deserve that future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our uh, guest speaker uh, for this morning, the former Prime Minister of Sweden, Goran Persson. Let's give him again a big round of applause. You have such great ideas, uh, Prime Minister. So many policies that you still want to implement. After being removed seven years as Prime Minister of Sweden, would you still want to be Prime Minister of your country again? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm putting you in the spot. Yeah, you are, you are. <laughs> Let me say like this. I miss it very much, but I don't want it back. Uh, Why don't you want it back, no, Prime Minister? You see, I have been there for a very, very long period. It is extremely stimulating, but it was also a very hard life. Today, I'm traveling around the world giving lectures, and I am also chairman of the board of different companies. I'm a consultant giving advices to those who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I'm also a farmer. So one day, I'm standing in front of you, 